Welcome, everybody, to today's webinar. Today's webinar is an inspirational webinar on bird photography, and we are very fortunate to have Scott Bourne as our guest. Now, Scott is an Olympus visionary. He's a professional wildlife photographer, an author, a lecturer, and a sign master photographer at Studio Masters China, which specializes in bird photography. Scott is also one of the founders of This Week in Photo, he founded photofocus.com and is co founder of the Photo Podcast Network. Scott is, of course, an executive at Skylum Software, which makes Luminar as well as Aurora. And he is a regular contributor to several photography related blogs and podcasts. And his photography has appeared in more than 200 books and magazines. And he's also a trainer at lynda.com and is the author of 11 photography books. So I'm really excited to hear what Scott has to say and look at his photos. So with that, I present to you Scott Bourne. Hey, thank you, Alba and Lori. I'm really excited to be here. I got to tell you, I don't do a lot of webinars. I think this is only the third one I've ever done. So everybody bear with me. I'm used to speaking in public or on a podcast, but this should be fun because I get to show you pictures along with my voice. I am going to talk about bird photography. This is not a commercial for Luminar, although I'll mention how I use it. If you do stick around to the end of the presentation, I've got one free fully licensed copy to give away, which we're going to do randomly. So stick around for that. Uh, the opening slide is uh, one of my favorite pictures I took this year when I was up in Alaska. Uh, if you aren't used to seeing this perspective on eagles, don't worry about it because it's unusual. I am about 24 inches away and this is Olympus's 17 millimeter f1.2 lens. That's why the picture looks so different. Uh, I kind of can get really close to eagles so I do that a lot and uh, hopefully I'll be in a position to make this uh, work for you. All right, if you want to be a good bird photographer, and by the way, you can take the word bird out of that sentence and substitute baseball photographer, swimming photographer, wedding photographer, whatever. The most important thing is you can do is learn a lot about your subjects. I studied ornithology because I really wanted to understand how birds think, why they do what they do, when they do what they do, where they do it, so it'd be easier to find them. Because unlike wedding photographers who are guaranteed the bride's going to show up on Saturday, I never know what I'm going to get when I go out. Sometimes I get bupkis, sometimes I get really lucky. As was the case here, where I got this beautiful Chilean flamingo in backlight. And uh, this is one of the things I like to do with birds. If I can get them in 100% backlight, it makes it look like you shot it in a studio, even though it was outdoors. Uh, this photo turned out well enough that Olympus used it in a worldwide mailing. All right. The next thing after studying birds, and I can't stress enough how important that first thing is, you really need to, to know how birds think. Uh, the next thing you have to do is find them, but the great news is they're everywhere. And uh, this particular bird I found in a zoo, believe it or not, uh, but he's from Africa. It's an African crown heron. You can find birds at your national parks, your national wildlife refuges, your zoos, and probably just around the corner. Birds are plentiful if you know where to look for them. We'll talk about that a little bit more here. So here are the top places for birds. Start in your own backyard. You can go to your local Audubon Society and ask them what kind of plants and bushes and trees are birds attracted to in your area. They'll tell you, you plant those, and guess what? Birds will show up because that's their home. And if you have a place for them to come and eat and to, to roost, they'll stop by. Now, you also can set up a portable blind in your backyard. A blind is nothing more than a hide is what it's called in Europe. It's simply something that blocks the vision the bird has of you. So it can be a cardboard box. It can be a tent. It can be anything at all that covers your form from the bird so he can't see you and just have a lens sticking out a hole and you're in a in a, a blind and then you're right there in your backyard that'll work if that doesn't appeal to you you can also check with local bird rescue centers i've worked a lot of uh, rescue opportunities these birds are are have a very important job they serve as ambassadors and educators for the world so that people can get a really good look at these birds and if you offer to give them some prints in almost every case they'll say yes in fact i've never heard a no so that's a great place to start looking for birds your local zoo like i said an ex excellent place because the habitats usually are very inviting to 
uh, free-flying birds, but of, often many zoos have captive birds, so stop by there. Most of you listening to my voice in the United States are within driving distance of a national wildlife refuge. America has this incredible thing called the National Wildlife Refuge System. It is true gem of our country. Uh, I've visited many of these national wildlife refuges. I spend a lot of time at them. In fact, I'm leaving for one tomorrow in New Mexico. These are birder paradises. You will find birds there and they're undisturbed in natural habitats. Great place to go. If you want to go to the most easy place in the world to photograph birds that I can think of, go to St. Augustine, Florida, which, by the way, happens to be the oldest city in the United States, and visit a place called the Alligator Farm. It's a zoo for alligators. And you're thinking, well, Scott, what's that got to do with birds? Well, I'll tell you what it has to do with birds. Birds are smart, sort of. Anyway, they work on a simple system. They build their nest above the alligators because the alligators eat their natural prey. So any 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 critter that would eat a bird is going to be eaten by the alligator. So the, the birds have sort of a symbiotic relationship with the alligator. Now, of course, if the bird or the egg falls in the alligator, well, it's going to die, but most time they don't. So this place is popular with alligators. Therefore, it's popular with birds. It's really good in the springtime. Uh, March and April are the best times because you can see chicks and they might be so close you can shoot them with your iPhone. Another really good place for me in the past has been Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge near St. Petersburg, Florida. But in any event, Audubon.org has a list of the places near you. And of course, Bolsky del Apache, where I'm heading tomorrow, is another great first put step to go because it is a loop surrounded by tens of thousands of snow geese and sandhill cranes. You can shoot them from your car. You can get out of the car. It's, it's amazing. These are just some examples. I could literally write a book about where to go photograph birds, but it's easier for you. Just do your research and that'll help you. And by the way, I'll just tell you quickly, if there's water, if there's food, and if there's cover, meaning bushes and trees, you can have birds. Uh, this photograph that I'm showing you on this slide actually is from Bolsca del Apache National Wildlife Refuge. I made this shot a long time ago. This is the main pond, and uh, every morning these geese and cranes take off from here, and every night they fly back in and they roost the night on the, on the pond. The reason they do that is their natural predators are coyotes. So the birds sleep on the water. So if a coyote jumps in the water and splashes, it'll wake them up and they can take off before they get eaten. And no, they're not cold. Their feathers are very insular. So uh, they do just fine. Now, if you listen to anything I tell you today, listen to this. It's about the sun and the wind. If you're a bird photographer, these are extraordinarily important things to pay attention to because if you get this wrong, you won't get a photograph that's saleable. Now, maybe some of you don't care about selling your pictures, in which case you can ignore it, but I try to sell all my pictures, so I have to have these rules followed. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. There's no exceptions. It's really important. Um, you want to make sure that the sun is at your back. That is really, really important. That means in bird photography, the best kind of lighting is flat lighting, full lighting, full on the bird. This helps to illustrate the color, the detail in the feathers, and it avoids shadows. If you have side lighting, you'll have a beak or a wing that creates a shadow across the bird that's very ugly. Uh, you can have one exception to this. I should have said there were no exceptions. There's one. You can be backlit. But for anything else, you've got to be front lit, not side lit. If you're a landscape photographer, side lighting is your friend. If you're a bird photographer, it's your enemy. So the sun has to be at your back. That's pretty simple. You can simply stand where you point your shadow at the bird and you know you're in the right place as far as the sun's concerned. The one thing that you can't have any control over is the wind. It can change directions. It might come from the south, then the north. You never know. But it's really important to know that birds fly into, perch into, and take off and land into the wind. This is aerodynamics. So if the wind is at your back and the sun is at your back, that is a holy moment in the bird photography world because that means birds are flying straight at you and you got perfect light. Doesn't happen very often, but if it does, stay out as long as you possibly can. Conversely, if the wind is in your face, meaning the sun's at your back, but the wind's at your face, Here's what you do. This is the official rule for all bird photographers. You go to Denny's because there's nothing in the world you can do. You're going to have nothing but bird butt, bird butt catalogs. That's it. Bird butt because the birds are going to fly away from you because they fly into the wind. So remember, pay attention to where the wind and the sun are. If they're not in the right places. That means you got to move. There's no other 
choice. You have to move. So another thing you can do is this is a lot like landscape photography. You do want to use the sun low in the sky when you're doing uh, birds in flight because that uh, that helps deal with shadow. And don't forget the flying into the wind. This goes all the way back, by the way, to the first slide where I said you got to understand birds. If you know that, then it really helps you figure this stuff out. So here's a picture um, where I was able to use the snow as a reflector. This is on a place called Soldovia Island. This is a native corporate land up in Alaska on the Kachemak Bay. And uh, this bird, I saw him looping around this island and coming in for landings and taking off. I don't know if he's doing touch and goes or what, but he did it two or three times. And I thought, well, I'll be ready in case he does it again. And sure enough, he did. And if you look on the wings underside, you see they're all lit up. Well, that's because the snow on this particular day, you, it just acted like a reflector. It bounced the sun back up and we got all kinds of detail in that underwing that we would not have seen, which makes this a really good picture. Uh, I like the motion. By the way, you'll note that the wings are extended out. Pay attention to the where the wings are because they're, believe it or not, are good and bad positions for the wings. And I'll tell you more about that later. All right. So just like in a lot of photography, sunrise and sunset are ideal times to get the uh, the subject and create contrast for silhouettes. Uh, when you're, we talked about birds in flight, the sun should be low. We talked about the direction of the light. Now here's the other thing that I see beginners make a mistake about all the time. You need to fill the frame with the bird, but don't crop so tight that his wings go out of frame. Uh, you know, if you have a long enough lens, you should be able to fill the frame or you have to be able to get close. But if you just have a little speck in the center, that doesn't count. You have to get you have to get enough of the bird that we can identify it. I hope that the, you're finding this helpful. If there are any questions, by the way, about bird photography, feel free to send them to Lori and Abba and they'll push them over to me and then uh, I will try to answer them as best I can. I'm going to go kind of fast here because I want to make sure that I get through all this material, but we will uh, we will get to the post-processing part in a bit where I will show you my workflow in Luminar and how I do all that. But I wanted to make sure that you at least have some basics if you're interested in capturing these images. Uh, the better your original photograph is, the better chance you're going to get a good result in post. So uh, when you work with flocks of birds, Believe it or not, there's a rule about separation. I know what you're thinking. You're like, Scott, I just feel lucky to get a picture of the bird in the frame. Well, I get it, but if you want to sell it or show it, you have to get really specific because there are lots of people out there going for these pictures and they all have one that's perfect. So you have to have a perfect one too. I try to make sure there's space between every wingtip, which means I throw away an awful lot of photographs that I love but because there's no separation, I can't use them. I occasionally make them an exception if the photo is really strong. I posted one of those photos the other day on Facebook, by the way, and it ended up being one of my best sellers. So I don't always live by this rule myself, but you want to try to. We talked about understanding your subject. I brought this up a couple times already because I can't tell you how much of a difference it makes. Here's a, here's a perfect example. You all have followed me. If you have followed me, you've seen my, my pictures of eagles. And you may wonder how I get some of those pictures where they're just ready to take off and I get the wings open. It's because I understand eagle behavior. I know how hard it is for an eagle to fly. So they have to defecate before they can leave the perch. So when I see a, an eagle lift his tail feathers and poop, then I know he's probably getting ready to fly. So I can have my camera at the ready and they start firing, in fact, before they even leave so that I make sure I get the optimum wing spread off of the perch. But if you don't know that about eagles, you might just think, oh, there's a bird pooping and not think anything of it. But uh, flight turns out to be hard. Their, their, their bones are even hollow to make sure that they get the best chance they can to get lift. So that uh, defecation sign, that's something to pay attention to. Now let's talk about something that's really hard. You got to have patience. Uh, most people that find out what I do have no understanding of what's really involved because they can't imagine doing it. <laughs> I usually get to an area and may spend the whole day there for a chance to photograph one bird because the way bird photography works is you got to find a background and then the bird and you have to wait because if you chase the bird, you're going to lose. They can fly. You can't. Game over. So what I do is I find a spot and I sit down on my little walk stool that I bought at B&H and I wait and I wait and I wait and I wait, and then I wait some more. And eventually a bird will show up. 
the more you're moving around, the more commotion there is, the more you're fidgeting, that's gonna scare the birds away. They scare easily. So your sudden movements are a problem. You being stand up tall with your tripod legs up over your shoulder, that's a real problem. You wanna be as small as you can and you wanna be low to the ground. Sitting down is a great place to start. Even laying down on your stomach. Of course, in my case, I'm still three feet off the ground when I do that, no, fat guy joke, sorry. Um, but at the end of the day, you have to minimize your movements and be at peace. This is hard for many people to do. I've I practice some meditation. I try to lower my heart rate. I try to just really calm myself because that makes me more approachable from the bird's point of view. If you stay in one spot and you don't move around a lot, I know it's counterintuitive, but you will get way more bird photos. I'll give you another example of this. There's a place called Gilbert, Arizona and near uh, Phoenix. There's a place called the Gilbert Water Ranch, which is a water treatment facility that draws a lot of birds and a lot of bird photographers go there. There at the main entrance to the area, there's a bunch of swirl cacti, and in these cacti, there are a bunch of nests for flickers, which is a kind of woodpecker. Well, I, I saw these woodpecker nests, I saw the swirl cacti, I walked about 30 feet away, sat my walk stool down, got on sun angle and wind angle, and just decided to wait. Up comes a car full of guys from the East Coast with their big lenses and tripods, and they're scurrying around because they see a scaled quail, then they see a killdeer. Then they see a flicker and they're just rushing around trying to catch these birds. And of course, they're not getting anything. And while they're doing that, they're disturbing all the birds I'm waiting on. So I called them over and said, guys, 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 come over, sit with me. If you'll sit with me for 20 minutes, I'll buy you a steak for lunch at any restaurant in town. So after some convincing, they decided to just sit down with me. And I said, if you'll just sit here, there's going to be something happening on these cacti. There's plenty of nests. So you'll see European starlings who love to raid the nest of other birds. You'll see the flickers. You'll maybe see acorn woodpeckers try to take over a nest. There's going to be a lot happening. Just stay here. Within 20 minutes, we saw 17 species. So it's just a matter of being patient and sitting down and sticking with it. I know this is hard, but if you can do that, you will become a better bird photographer. And by the way, probably works with any kind of photography. This is a picture that I also took at Bolsky del Apache, and this picture has got a couple of illustrations. Number one, it shows how you can work silhouettes at sunset and get a good shot, make sure you have something interesting in the foreground. But number two, there are three birds, because yes, in bird photography, the editors buy pictures provided they are not in any grouping of even numbers, with the one exception of you can have a pair of birds. But then otherwise, it's one, three, five, seven, nine, four, six, eight, ten don't sell. I know that's stupid. Trust me. I've argued it doesn't do any good. Now, I mean, maybe there's an exception, but generally all the people I work with, they want an odd number of birds because it's more visually pleasing. And they also want to see these three wing positions. At most, the one in the middle with the flat wings, that can only be there. That's called pancake. You can only get that position and get away with it when you have the other two in the shot. Like here we have one with the wings up. Here we have one with the wings down, and here we have a pancake position. Believe it or not, that's like the ultimate coup de gras. That's what you want. But if you just have the birds in their pancake position, they're not, they're usually not starters. They're not going to sell. So I know it's very hard. You're thinking to yourself, I've got to get there. I've got to find the birds. I've got to wait for the birds. I've got to get the perfect ladder. I've got the perfect wind. Now you're telling me i got to get the perfect wing position. I didn't say it was easy. That's why they call it a J-O-B. It's probably better to be a wedding photographer. I, I rue the day I made this decision sometimes because I sit out there and bust my butt and get nothing. But it's ultimately I must I must really love it because I've been doing it a long time. Here's some more gear tips. Really important to know your gear. If you have that once in a lifetime chance where the eagle's going to land full wing spread in front of you, this is not a good time to try to figure out how to change your shutter speed. <laughs> read your manual before you go. In fact, if you're going to go somewhere to photograph birds on a plane. Read your manual on the plane. Read your manual in the hotel the night before. Make sure you practice with all the features and settings. Make sure your battery's charged up. Make sure you've got your card erased and in the right place. Have your stuff together because when you're doing bird photography, things happen in milliseconds. And you don't get a lot of time re to react. 
you have to be prepared. And if you're not prepared, you're gonna lose. So I really wanna encourage you to know your camera's features. I'll give you a little hint on how to do this that might sound crazy, but everyone I know, and I've given this hint to thousands of photographers over my career, everyone I know that's done it has come back to me and said it really helped. Just read a page in your manual every day, no matter what, for the next year. This means you'll probably end up reading through your manual two or three times, that's good. Read a page in your manual and then get the camera out and do whatever that manual page is talking about. If it says, this is how you set the rear curtain shutter sync, and you say, Scott, I'll never use that. You don't know that. So practice it, learn how to use it, because that one time when you may need it, you'll have it in memory. Go through the whole book that way. Handling the camera will help you, getting your muscle memory down, figuring out where these buttons are, doing it over and over and over, makes it so that when you're in the field, you're not guessing, you don't know what you know, you don't want to be in a position where you're fiddling for the dials because you get one shot at some bird flying right by you. You got to take it. And this is actually an, an argument that's going to sound weird coming from me, but it's a good argument for keeping your cameras for a while because then you get to really know them. Change lenses more often than cameras. That's my advice. Now, for those of you that want to do birds in flight, this is crucial. Um, it is very difficult to get them sharp if you're shooting below a thousandth of a second. Uh, big birds like eagles and such, I look at one sixteen hundredth of a second as a bare minimum. And even then, I may get just a teeny tiny bit of blur on the very ends of the wingtips, which I'm actually okay with because it implies motion. But to go completely freezing action wingtip to wingtip, usually sixteen hundredth is a minimum and, and two thousandth is better. Of course, now what I'm telling you is you're going to have to shoot wide open to get that and you're going to have to bump your ISO. The good news is that even cheap cameras these days do a good job with higher ISOs up to one, maybe 32,000. And, um, you know, I, I guarantee you that you can get enough in the way of software to fix the noise problems that it's, it's more important that you get the shot sharp in camera, because if you don't, it's not going to matter what happens later. So bump that shutter speed, bump that ISO, shoot wide open to help you if you don't have enough light, and you'll get much sharper pictures. Um, it's really important to also think about the other side of this coin that makes it even harder, though, which larger birds, you may have to stop down. So how you reconcile shooting at 1 1600th and you got to stop down to F8? Well, here's the bad news. You got to really pump the ISO in those cases. The exposure triangle is aperture, shutter speed, ISO, and you have to use those together however you need to get what you want. But because these birds are so large, if you're particularly close to them, like I work with long lenses, the depth of field can be half an inch. So you really have to stop down sometimes. It's, it is a slight advantage of micro four thirds that I don't have to stop down as often. I get the same light as any aperture, but because of the different sensor size, I have the effect of a little more depth of field. For me and my business, that's a good thing. So hopefully that makes sense to you. Remember, the closer you are to a subject, the shorter the depth of field. The further you're away, the longer the depth of field. So if you're working close to birds like I do, long lenses in particular, you will want to stop down. Just like in portraiture, you want to think about maybe focusing on just the eye. I know it's hard, but almost every camera, including my Olympus OMD EM1 Mark II, has the ability to, to go down to one focus point. Put that on the bird's eye, you'll be in the ballpark. But remember, if you rely on complete auto systems and you're working with narrow depth of field, you may have the bird's beak in focus, but not the eye. And that's a no-go. You've got to get the eye. In fact, you do, it's just like portraiture. You have to get the eye that's closest to the camera. If you can't get the second eye, it's not the end of the world. But you have to have the eye closest to the camera in focus. So the only way to do that is put your autofocus point right on the eye. And then the next thing is really important. We're talking about catch lights. If you don't know what a catch light is, it's the little bright spot in the pupil that comes from the sun or a flash, whatever your light source is. Because if you don't have catch light in the eye, the joke in bird photography is it looks like taxidermy. It could be a dead bird that you're photographing. We got to have a catch light. So make sure that you can see that in the camera's viewfinder. If you can't see the catch light, the viewer won't be able to see it in the photograph. So you need to change something. And by the way, that's an important rule. When things aren't working, just change them. Don't just keep doing them and hoping something will change because it doesn't work that way. You've got to make a conscious decision to move or change the light or get on a better angle or you know whatever you can think of to, to change things up. As I said before, remember, wings up or down, not pancake flat, unless you've got a perfect group of three like I had in that last shot. 
Um, remember, she photographed birds in pairs, otherwise odd numbers. It's more pleasing compositionally. At least that's what all the editors who pay for my photos tell me. And so since they're the boss in that case, I got to listen. This is probably one of the most important things for all photography from my perspective, but certainly in wildlife photography, bird photography, clean backgrounds make for better pictures. If you've ever been on my one of work, I used to teach a lot of workshops, I don't now, but I used to teach, and if you've ever been on one of my workshops, no doubt you heard me many 80 times during the week say, background, background, background. I implore my students to check the background. If there is a freeway with a bunch of trucks in the background of this shot of an eagle, it's not nearly as pleasing. In this case, I was lucky. He was standing in front of a snowbank, so I had a snowbank, so I had a white background. But a clean, simple background is what you generally want, uh, particularly if you're doing bird portraits or any kind of portraits, because the subject of the photograph is the creature or the person, not the background. For those of you who like to have a lot of stuff in your background that makes it look like things are complex, I, I, I promise you, you're competing for the viewer's vision, and they may not be sure what you want them to look at. In this case, I want people to look at the feather detail around the eye. I want them to see the power of the eagle. He's looking up. Um, and there's nothing there to, to, to get in the way. It's just a clean, simple background. Most of my best-selling images have clean, simple backgrounds. So it's background, background, background. If you want to help yourself when you're out on a photography exhibition, uh, ex excuse me, expedition, you want to say that to yourself all day. Background, background, background. Look at the background. And by the way, if it's not right, often moving six inches to the left or right or up and down will change everything. So you know, just move if you have to. It's it's super easy. So let's recap. After staying on sun angle, paying attention to the wind direction, background, background is the most important factor in deciding what and where you're going to photograph. I believe that if you can eliminate clutter from your shots, you will improve your photography, whatever you shoot, no matter what your subject. Um, you can also help a little bit here with depth of field by shooting wide open. I once photographed a kill deer who was literally standing in front of an outhouse, but I was using an 800 millimeter lens at its closest focusing distance, which meant that even at F8, everything behind me, the, the bird, like within four inches was out of focus. So sometimes that's a way to do it, but you really want to make sure you've got a clean background. You really, you, you just can't, I can't tell you how much of a difference this makes. Finding a nice background should be the driving force in all of your photography, whatever you shoot, because it helps set the stage, it helps you to tell the story, it makes it easier to key in on the subject. And it's always the most successful when it comes to sales, at least in my experience. People like a simple background, it lets them know what they're supposed to be looking at. So those visual cues are in the hands of the artist. You're the artist, so make some choices. Like I say, move left or right. Get higher, get lower, change the background. If you don't like your background, you want a clean sky as a background, here's a simple rule that almost always works. Sit down, and then as the bird flies up, he'll be in the sky. Now you have the sky as a background, super clean, super easy. This is just a matter of being conscious and deliberate about your thought processes and trying to decide where you want to be in relationship to the bird to make sure you get the best possible shot. And here's an example of some su super simple backgrounds. Uh, we have a hummingbird, top left corner, just a nice green background. There's a little bit of foreground from the flowers. Um, the great egrets landing on that perch. Again, simple blue background. And a northern cardinal uh, happened to photograph in Texas against a beautiful green background sitting on a perch. These may look simple to you. These, All three of these photographs have licensed and sold. So it just goes to show you that the simpler the photo, sometimes the more successful. There's no question about what I want you to look at here. It's the bird, not the background. So I am going to briefly talk about my gear. Now, you know, I am an Olympus visionary. This is not a secret. So obviously I'm sponsored by Olympus, but I did buy all my Olympus gear before I switch and switched before they made me a visionary. I'm extremely sad about that order of events, by the way, but that's what happened. Uh, so uh, I will talk to you a little bit about what I do. Um, this is my like main kit, basically, in terms of lenses. I use the 300 F4 IS Pro, which is equivalent to like a 600 F4 lens with an effective focal length of 600 millimeters on the crop sensor body. And then I use the um, the... 300 in conjunction with the 1.4 teleconverter, which gives me an effective focal length of 840. 
Now that's one stop, you lose a stop of light for the 1.4, so that's 5.6. Um, we have the 12 to 100 F4 Pro IS camera. This is good for flight shots when the birds are close. It is a constant aperture F4 and it has Sync IS, which is Olympus dual IS system that combines the in-body stabilization with the lens for six and a half stops of real stabilization. And then the 40 to 150 F2.8 Pro. This is a super light lens with a super fast aperture. And it's one of my favorite flight shots. And it's frankly the lens I use more often than not in bird photography. It has the equivalent of an 80 to 300 uh, against a 35 millimeter. That, that's a perfect focal range for bird photography. Not many DSLRs come with lenses in that focal range, but I'm glad that Micro Four Thirds does. It's changed my life being able to have that focal range. And in the 85 to 95 percentile range when I'm in Alaska, that's what I'm using. Here's basically my whole kit. I do bring the 900 flash for the hummingbirds. I also have a grip that I bring on one of my three bodies just because it makes it easier to hold the long lens. Um, I have two bodies that I can I bring that are my workhorses and I always have a third, what I call virgin body. That's not something I use at all, but it's just my backup, backup, backup. They're all the same camera. I know that's expensive for some of you, but for me, I have to do it because my muscle memory is very highly tuned to the OMD EM1 Mark II, as it was back when I shot Canon, as it was back when I shot Nikon. You know, you don't want to be constantly changing to a different body where you're you're not going to have the muscle memory and you're going to miss a few shots. And just for fun, I do bring the 17, uh, excuse me, the 7 to 14 or the 17 for super wide angle shots because I can get very close to birds. I put those in the bag. I don't use them a lot, but when I get a chance to use them, I use them just because they create such a unique perspective. All this gear is right about a third of the weight, third to two thirds of the weight of my old DSLR stuff, and same with price. So it's been kind of a thing. So I'm going to see if there are any questions here. I have not seen any questions on my go to meeting thing, Lori or Abba, so I'm guessing there have been none to you, but I wanted to ask before I move into the Luminar portion of my presentation, oh, if anybody has any questions. We've been hiding them from you so that we won't distract you, but there have been many questions and they're awesome questions, all leading from what you've taught us. And and I just want to point out that the number one comment is how much detail and how you're giving away all these great secrets. So I want to thank you for the detail of that. That's been amazing. I want to pass on the thank yous from the people who are listening in. So, oh, good. so yeah, this has been awesome. Amazing amount of detail in such a short amount of time. So let's go to some of the questions. Some you've actually answered in context. Um, the first one is... Now, are you shooting everything handheld, or do you uh, shoot some of this tripod? Well, that's a great question. Since I've switched to Olympus, I don't use my tripod much at all. It's mostly to rest the camera on, not because I need stabilization, because I can handhold 840 millimeters effective focal length down to 1 60th of a second with the Olympus IS. But I do often use a monopod, again, mostly just to rest the big lens so that my arms don't get tired, but not from a stabilization standpoint. And frankly, if I am doing stuff like sunsets with birds flying through, I use my platypod. I don't know if any of you all know what the platypod is, but it's a thing that'll fit in your pocket and can be, you know, tacked on with some wire or some rubber bands or some bungee cords to a fence or a pole. I use that all the time. So I, I do have plenty of tripods, monopods, but I use my platypod when I can. Monopod I use almost everywhere just again to rest the lens. Now at Bosque where I'm doing a lot of heavy duty long range flight photography, I will bring a tripod with a gimbal head. A gimbal head is a swivel head, looks like a gun turret. Um, but almost everything you're seeing, I'm gonna say 85 to 90% of my shots that are published in the last two years are handheld. Excellent, thank you so much for that. Do you use any kind of camo equipment to hide the lens so that the birds don't recognize it? <laughs> the folks that sell that stuff sure want to make you think that works. But to tell you the truth, the birds know you're there. Trust me. Unless you're in a complete blind or a hide, they know you're there. And then I might use that if I was sticking the lens out. But the last thing they're concerned about is the lens. They're much more concerned about you and your form. Um, and you, you, know, you can even dress in camo and they still know you're there. I don't think this helps that much. I've tried it. Um, I will tell you this. Dressing in bright colors is a bad idea. So I don't know that you have to go to the extent of wearing, you know, camo. But I don't think you want to 
pink fuchsia shirt either. So the bright colors do disturb birds and scare them. So I would avoid that. Muted, you know, earth tones is probably good enough. And, you know, it doesn't matter. If you want to protect your lens with that camel stuff, that's cool. But I don't think it makes a difference. Everybody that's seen my pictures over the last two years, I don't have any of that stuff for my Olympus bodies. I used to have some of them in Canon stuff because they gave it to me. But I haven't you bought any for my Olympus things, and I'm doing pretty good without it. That's great. That's great to know. What about, um, I know you're shooting at a very high shutter speed, but panning with birds in flight when you're shooting? That's about a 30th of a second. That goes the other way. I shoot around a 30th, 40th of a second, and it takes a lot of practice. And you're just going to know that you're only going to get a few keepers. But we do that in the early morning light before the sun comes up just for fun. And it comes, I've occasionally come up with some pictures that I really enjoy. Um, they're not tremendous sellers. I've gotten one shot panning with a bird in my career that's been a tremendous seller. But it's fun to do. Yeah, you want to go the other way. You want to slow your shutter speed down to about a 30th of a second. And then it's just practice, staying with the bird and trying to focus on the eye. Because you do want to try to get the eye as sharp as possible, even though the rest of the bird's going to be blurry. And I guess when it goes with uh, making sure the right area is sharp, you use, I guess, um, the question was autofocus. How you, if you do use any of that, how you set that up for single point, multi-point or how you really get the eye versus the, the, the beak? Okay, that's a good question. Now, um, if you're an Olympus shooter, you can go to the Olympus website, and there's an article I've written on birds in flight and autofocus settings there for Olympus shooters. But in general, here are the rules. A lot depends on the size of the bird, your proximity to the bird, and the background. So if this blue sky is the background, um, I'm going to have all 121 autofocus points active on my Olympus camera, uh, 61 on your Canons and whatever it is on the Nikons I haven't kept up. But because it's there's nothing going to compete with the bird for the autofocus's attention. Remember, it's just a dumb computer looking for the closest big object to focus on. If it's a constant blue sky and a bird in front of it, then it's going to automatically find the bird. So I'll use 121 autofocus points, especially with enough depth of field, not worry about it. But if I have a bird that's perched on a tree and there's a lot of brush and there's some ins and outs and maybe even other birds on the perch, then what I'll do is I'll go down to single point autofocus and try to just roll that around with the thumb rocker in the back of the camera and keep it on the eye. If I'm not able to do that because the bird's moving too much, I'll go to a grouping of five and sometimes even nine autofocus points. So it all depends on the background. If I'm really close to the bird and he fills up the frame, then I'm less concerned about it. If I'm far enough away, then I, then I have to try to drill down and get it right on the bird's head because... Again, if you, you get the body in focus, the feet in focus, the bill in focus on a duck, for instance, it doesn't matter. Oh, that that's great advice. I that I think that hits the nail on the head and answers a lot of uh, the questions that we've been given. And you, you did talk about shooting close, and there was a question about sometimes your work, you, you're really tight on the birds, and you don't necessarily mm -hmm. show all of the wings. Do you have any rules where and when you crop? Or literally in the question, they say, or do you just wing it? <laughs> that's a good one uh I, I i just you know here's the thing this may get a little ethereal for this audience but i try to feel my way to a photograph that's the way i work for me photography is actually an expression of my emotions much the way a singer might cry during a song for me i have a very t um complicated and involved relationship with the birds they're my my favorite subject um i have a lot of stuff in mind when i'm dealing with them so I try to feel my way to a photograph. If I feel like the bird's expression is enough, I might crop out the wings. Uh, if I feel like the bird's magnificent in, in flight, maybe I'll include all the wings. So it really is just a personal decision. The thing is, the people on the forums, I'm sure, have a rule because they got a rule for everything, but I ignore them, and I just do whatever I feel in my heart is right. And that's what my advice is to anyone that's here on the webinar. I, I think what's really has come out of your presentation is your passion for shooting birds. And I think that's one of the reasons that you get such amazing shots, because it's not just something you're just going into, you know, I'm going to shoot some birds today. And it's, it's obvious that you absolutely love everything about birds and, and, and photographing them. So that's a wonderful takeaway for anybody listening. Uh, in reference to, again, shooting, do you shoot JPEG versus RAW to get a faster burst rate, and also mechanical versus uh, electronic shutter? What are your thoughts? Um, 
on my camera, I can shoot up to 60 frames a second um, in JPEG, but I don't need to. Um, I shoot at 10 frames a second and mechanical shutter, and here's why. On the Olympus cameras, that's how the tracking autofocus can work and keep up. If you shoot faster than 10 frames a second, the tracking autofocus stops working and the autofocus is set from the first exposure in the frame. But, or excuse me, in the burst. But um, I shoot at 10 frames per second mechanical strutter because on the Olympus, that's what gives me tracking autofocus. So it moves with the bird. Um, and I find that 10 frames a second is more than enough. In fact, I've got lots of published pictures back from 15 years ago when the cameras were six frames a second. <laughs> we thought that was fast. So 10 is more than enough. Um, and I shoot, I shoot raw just because... I photograph a lot of tough subjects. Like I photograph eagles. Well, let's see, they're white on top and black on bottom. <laughs> so the dynamic range becomes an issue. So I do shoot raw to give me, myself a little bit of help. And I'll tell you one, my first mention of Luminar here, um, a secret in Luminar is we have our own con raw converter in Luminar, much like Adobe has ACR, we have the develop filter. And in my experience, at least with the kind of photography I do, I'm consistently able to get about a half stop more dynamic range out of our raw develop filter than I am with other products. So when I'm shooting white and black subjects in the same scene, that's really helpful. So I do shoot raw. Uh, I, I don't shoot JPEG, but I, I, do sh I do shoot raw plus JPEG so that I have a quick reference file if I need to just check my work. Excellent, thank you for that. Now, when you're shooting, and you talked about eagles because there were questions about how you get such detail uh, in in those shots. Other than um, the ability to bring it out in post, uh, other other techniques that you use to be able to sure. pull such detail? That's an incredibly good question. Um, number one, I work with Olympus lenses, which maybe I'm biased, but I think they're the best in the world. They have incredibly good contrast, good clarity, good color fidelity, and they're very sharp. If they're properly operated by a competent uh, user, <laughs> then they help a lot because I just think that since I've switched to Olympus about two years now, um, a little more than two years, it, it, it's, it's just been amazing to me how sharp those lenses are. So that helps. Secondly, one little trick here that I'll give away is I expose to the right. So we all have histograms on our cameras, even the cheapest ones. And if you look at that histogram and you try to get a perfect exposure where you're not clipping on the bottom or the top and everything's right in the middle, well, that's kind of a fairy tale as to that being the best solution. It may make the best looking image in the viewfinder, but I'm not shooting for what the viewfinder looks like. I'm shooting for post. And to get to post, before I ever do get to post, I cheat a little bit to the right, meaning I will load the exposure up on the high side, maybe overexpose a half stop, even two thirds of a stop, as long as I'm not clipping. And I set my highlight blinky war uh, a warning so that I make sure I'm not. But then I'm giving a lot more data to Luminar to work with because each of those quadrants in your histogram is exponentially full of data, one more than the other. So quadrant one has X, quadrant two has an exponential times X, quadrant three the same, quadrant four the same. So you give it more data to work with, that gives you more detail to pull out in post to begin with. Excellent, thank you. And following up on that, I mean, you obviously know so much about your camera and what it can do. And I think it goes back to the statement of stick with the camera and know the camera. One of the questions was with all these complex menu systems on the Olympus, and, and I think it's true of all the cameras, do you use any uh, quick settings or assign any settings to buttons? And if so, what would your favorites be? Well, if you go to the Olympus website, you can read my article, which has all my autofocus settings. And yes, I do set them to custom function one. And most cameras have the ability now to set your favorite settings to one, two, or three custom functions so you don't fiddle with it. And I got to be honest, uh, but I haven't touched the settings on the back of my camera in a year. It's just always the same because I do the same thing all the time. I shoot birds. It's not like next week I'll take a time out and do a wedding because I don't. So I shoot birds, so I always have the same settings. But use those custom functions. They're there for a reason. You can save those to a card in some cases or to a website. And so that if you lose your camera settings, you don't have to go back through and set it all up. But I'm not one of those guys that tries to learn how to be an expert at the camera. I try to make the camera do what I need it to do, and then I stop. 
<laughs> I have a, I'm an old man. I have a 256 K brain with about two terabytes for the data trying to get into it. So I don't learn anything. I don't have to. Well, it seems like you've learned a lot already because your images are truly stunning. Well, the, thank you. My, my, uh, no, no, thank you. And as a matter of fact, one of the questions, it's kind of diverting from the technical aspect, which is uh, a good source to study and learn about birds. Oh, well, there's, there's plenty. Um, I would start with a, a, any field guide, like the Sibley Guide to Birds. Um, Cornell University has an amazing online presence. Uh, you can go there. Their ornithological uh, studies there are the, the best in the world. That's where I studied. Um, you can get tons of information from Audubon. Uh, you know, just, just pick up any bird guidebook or hang out with birders. That's another thing. So there's two kinds of people. There's birders. Those are the people that don't take pictures. And then there's bird photographers. We're, we're similar. We know a lot about birds. We love birds. We keep life lists. That's a list of all the birds we've seen. But photographers tend to do it visually, and birders tend to do it with a checklist. But you know, the average birder will know tons of facts about the few species that they, that they like or local to them. And again, the secret in this game is getting information. And of course, the internet has made all of this so much easier. There are tons of websites. You can just search you know, info about birds, and you can find all kinds of facts that really do help you. Like when I first started to photograph hummingbirds, my, all my field of study in the past had been raptors, so I started doing some online research. And I found out, you know, hummingbirds are the only bird in the world that can fly backwards. Well, that was helpful to me when I was trying to figure out what my setup would look like. Um, just, just get into some of these online resources and you really can't go wrong. That's great. And I'm going to follow up in reference to the hummingbirds because you did comment that you like to bring flash along, especially when shooting hummingbirds. Could you talk a little bit about when you use a flash or if you use high speed sync or just what, what your thoughts are with flashes and birds? Yeah, so this is a controversial area. Um, in my experience, and based on all my re personal research, flash doesn't bother birds or harm birds in any way. Now, Audubon likes to say that it does because they're mostly birders and not bird photographers. But I've checked with a whole bunch of people all over the world, just met with uh, the guy who is dean of the Ornithological Society in Hungary, which, by the way, happens to be one of the best places for birds in the world. He agreed with me. There's only one instance that I can verify that it bothers birds. If you photograph a hummingbird while it's sitting on a nest incubating an egg, that can be damaging to a hummingbird, but only in that limited situation where the bird is on a nest incubating an egg. Short of that, I don't think flash bothers birds, but I don't use it a lot. I use it at night occasionally to make a dramatic picture, but with hummingbirds, you have to use it if you want to freeze the wings because it's, it's not a matter of the shutter speed being enough. It's a matter of the flash duration being enough. So I use four flashes, one on the background, three on the bird, and um, this, the flash sync in my camera is 250th of a second, but it's the short flash duration from electronic flash, anywhere from one four thousandth to one ten thousandth of a second, that actually freezes the action on the bird. I use the, the four flashes in, in conjunction with each other. And uh, while I can use high speed sync, I actually try to make it hard. <laughs> it's just for sport. I've done enough of this now that I'm trying to up my game. So I use single shot mode, one picture. That that's that's great information, and I'm going to actually di uh, direct uh, the questions away just for a little bit because we want to see some of the tricks that you use in Luminar to really bring out the detail and take those bird pictures to the next level. I can do that. This is a photograph of a barn owl. It happens to be what we call a feather perfect barn owl. And I'm opening this photograph in Photoshop because I will just tell you that the number one question. I get of it is can Luminar work with Photoshop and Lightroom? And the answer is absolutely. Can it work without them? Absolutely. And I could show it to you that way, but since I get more question about can it work in Photoshop, I just thought I would demonstrate it here. So here's Photoshop and uh, I have the picture and I'm just going to hit uh, Command J, which duplicates the layer. So then I'm going to go to the filter, and right here we have Luminar 2018. I'm going to call up our plugin, which installs automatically when you get Luminar. And now you have the Luminar interface. And I'm going to go ahead and maximize that so it fills the whole screen. Um, I really like the way that Luminar puts the picture up front. 
and you, you can see your image really nicely. You can you can blow it up. You can see before and after. You get a really good look at the histogram. By the way, I think I nailed that exposure. I did. <laughs> um, and my favorite thing, Abba, this is this. I'll just give you my little bit of background on this. I was involved with Adobe since 1992. I have taught with Thomas Knoll. I have been asked by Adobe is to be an influencer in the past. And I've basically had Adobe products free most of my life. And I had Adobe sitting on my computer when I bought Luminar. I did not work at the company, contrary to popular belief, just like I didn't work at Olympus when I switched. I bought this on my own and tried it out. I'd heard a lot about it, thought it was interesting. And I immediately fell in love with it. And the next thing I knew, I was working at the company. But um, one of my first things, Abba, that I liked was these workspaces. So you can create a custom workspace. And yes, you can do this in Photoshop too, but it's not nearly as intuitive and almost nobody that uses Photoshop I know actually knows you can do this. And we, we ship the product with a lot of different workspaces that are pretty cool. But what's nice about it is you can make your own. And I've made my own. And so here we go. I'm gonna click my own workspace called Bird's Drama. And, um, you know, it's it's a it's a starting point with the filters that I use. And I don't we have around 50 filters in Luminar. And if I have those all up here, it, it can be somewhat, you know, discombobulating. I can't see immediately what I want to do to a picture. So with this, I call up all the filters that I'm normally going to use. Um, this is actually one of my older workspaces. I've slightly modified this one, but I'll, I'll, I'll make that change in real time. And what's cool is that you can change this, you can add to it, and you're in no way limiting yourself. You can click add filter, and there's all the filters that we have. So it's not like you're limited to these. It's just that Dima, our co-founder and CTO, he thought, let's make the picture the star, and we want to give it the most real estate. So I like that about that. So this is our developed filter. I might use this to do all those typical things that you want to do to a picture just on it at its basic level. You can adjust the exposure up or down, and you can see that the uh, histogram, the top right of the screen, moves in real time with you. Uh, you can adjust your contrast, highlights, blacks, etc. Huge saturation layer for colors, uh, tone, uh, saturation, and vibrance. I don't really use uh, clarity and structure that much. I have switched. I'm gonna. If you hit this little red button, you can get rid of a filter. And you can then add. And what I've been using in the last probably six months to a year is our details enhancer. Now, the first thing that you're going to note is the filter that I'm not showing you here that you might wonder about is, well, where's the sharpening filter? Here's the big secret, Abba. People are telling you in the comments how detailed my pictures were. Well, that's because I use our detailed enhancer. Mm -hmm. I, don't use, I don't use sharpening at all. I just use our detail enhancer for the most part. And uh, you can set the small, the medium, and the large details. And uh, you can zoom in to see what those, those things look like by hitting the plus sign. And then you can create a little split window and you can see, look at the difference. Wow, that's look good. That. Now look at what I really like is this feather detail because as a bird photographer, and the one that knows a lot about birds, I know how much detail there are on these guys. But if this bird flies by you, you'll never see that, right? You just won't. Mm -hmm. So I like being able to create that level of detail. Now, if it's too much, I can back it off. And then there's this thing called filter amount, which I really like, which acts as an opacity slider. So you can adjust the whole thing. So that's pretty cool. But anyway, um, I, I, and you can you can fit to the screen and, and see that what it's going to look like in real time. But here's something else that's a secret. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, Ab, I get paid to put my finger on the shutter button. I do not get paid to put my finger on the mouse button. So I know that on the forums, people like to puff their chest out about how detailed their Photoshop workflow is and how it takes them two hours per picture. Well. I live in a world where I've got 15 seconds per picture because if I'm two hours a picture, I'll never get paid. I'll never be outside again where I have to shoot the birds to begin with. So I like to rely on presets. Presets are not a bad word. And when you hear people say pros don't use presets, it's pretty much the opposite. Pros rely heavily on presets because it saves time. That's what I'm all about. 
and I do have one big advantage maybe over some in our audience, I pretty much just shoot birds. So I don't have to have a whole lot of rigmarole involved in my post-processing. I simply want to be able to do what I need to do to make my pictures pop. So I have created my own presets. But uh, before I get on with that, I do want to say that, you know, you can make, you can go over to your workspaces and you can save a new workspace. You can set one as your default. Um, I, I really, you know, I'm using main workspace now, a uh, main bird workspace. This is the one that has the, the the updated thing with detail enhancer. I could make this my default so that when I come into Luminar, that's what I see at first. I can set something else as default and switch to it. But remember, I've always got all these filters here that I can also add. At no point in time, have I created any kind of problem for myself? And what's really kind of crazy, and you know this, Abba and Lori, mm -hmm. but maybe our audience don't, is that you can have multiple instances of a filter. You can have two clarity filters. I just added another one, or three or four or five. Same with presets. You can add multiple presets, and they can stack on top of each other. And I'll show you that in a minute. So here's some of our presets now. I have some presets that I've downloaded, but you get a bunch of presets for free with the program. When you go to our website at Skylum.com, you you will be able to find additional presets you can both buy or get for free. Um, our friend Rich Harrington created all the presets to match a product that we used to sell when we were Mac Fun called Tonality, and I downloaded all those because I thought they were pretty cool. And there's some basic street, outdoor. You can click on these, like travel, and then across the bottom of the page, you'll see what they look like. And what I really like about the way we handle presets is you get to see what the finished product is going to look like in a thumbnail. So you can say, that's the preset. Now, I think that's kind of ugly, but you get the idea. Mm -hmm. What's unique about our presets is that you can make your own. You can, you can buy them. You can share them. You can even sell them. So um, those presets that you make on your own go into a folder we've titled user presets. And I have just two because I do the same thing all the time. So it's pretty straightforward with me. I'm looking at this picture and I could go through and take all the time to make the manual adjustments. I know how to do that. But since I know that I got a good exposure, because most of the time I do, I'm just going to click my basic preset and that's it. I'm done with that. That's my basic preset. You can see the before and the after, okay? If I want, I can mask out this stuff in the back. You do that either in Luminar or in Photoshop. Um, some people prefer to create their layer mask in Photoshop. If so, you can do that. But that's, that's my first preset, and here comes my second. Boom. Now, what's really neat is I've got this slider here, again, that's like an opacity slider. So I put one on top of the other, and I, I could, I've chosen one over the other, but I could put one on top of the other by simply saying overlay preset. So you can actually stack presets on top of each other, change their opacity so that they all merge together. It's pretty wild. Then you click apply, and in this case, because I wanted to demonstrate Luminar as a plugin, it will apply the preset into Photoshop on the layer that I just made. So there it is before, there it is after. So if you wanted to, you know, you could erase the preset in the background. You can see here how that would work. You have all kinds of options. Uh, I just wanted you to get the basic idea that it can work in Photoshop. And by the way, in Lightroom, the same way. Now what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna open up Luminar standalone without Photoshop. And when you do that, you just click on here to open any image. I've got a couple of images here that I want to show you right here. Um, let's see if I want this one or this one or this one or this one. I want this one. So this is actually the eagle photograph I was describing in my presentation. I don't have separation between the birds like I usually want to, but it worked out to be a pretty spectacular photograph. It's my 10th most licensed image. Now this is right out of the camera and you can see it's a little flat and actually I kind of like it that way, but I want to show you a brand new filter that people who own Luminar 2018 got for free. 
And if you don't own Luminar 2018, you buy it, you'll get it for free. One of the crazy things we do uh, is we update our program on a regular basis and we don't always charge for it. Sometimes we just go, eh, they should have this one because it's mm -hmm. that cool. So I'm going to click add filter. All right. Now, when I, when I want, you can, by the way, you can type up here whatever the name is you want, but I happen to know it's an essential because I consider it essential. It's called AI Sky Enhancer. And with one simple drag of a slider, I can work on the sky. See how it's darkening the sky, blowing it up? But I didn't make a mask, Abba. How did it work that way? Well, the accent AI filter we put out before was a hint on how this could work. We're using artificial intelligence. It's masking the bird so that automatically we just work on the sky and you don't have to take the time to make a mask. Remember what I said, I get paid to put my finger on the shutter button, not on the mouse button. So this simplifies it. I don't have to have a mask. Now, a lot of people listening that are already users of our product or interested in our product have been asking me questions about our new module coming out soon called Luminar Libraries. Mm -hmm. And they ask me questions like this, Abba. They'll say, well, does it do complex layer masking? Is there a quick mask brush? Can you do refined edges on that brush? And is there a selection brush? And is the selection brush resizable? And can that selection brush work in an alpha channel? And they give me this big, long list of questions. And I just usually stop them and say, why do you want all that? And if they have an answer, it might be to say something like, well, I want to mask out the sky so I can create a better sky. <laughs> <laughs> well, wouldn't it be easier if I just said, yeah, drag this slider from the left to the right. That's all. <laughs> it does all that stuff for you. It's really cool. Um, I really like the power of it. And in fact, for people in our audience that don't really care at all about uh, learning a lot of post-processing, you could use this filter and you could use our Accent AI filter, which is sort of a general touch-up filter. And look what happens. Look how I'm look how the picture is brightening up, the colors are popping and getting detail. I'm not doing any masking, I'm not doing any selections, but let's look at it before and after. Oh my gosh. So remember I mentioned it was kind of flat? That's where you started. I clicked two daggum buttons in two seconds. I went from this to this. Now, if you don't like this, that's okay, because here's the cool thing. This, remember, I told you each of our filters has uh, the ability to be treated almost like a layer just with a simple opacity slider. You can back it off here. So maybe I want 50% of that. It's very subtle, but it's better than that. I don't know if this translates over the webinar screen, but I like it around right there. So this level of control with a simple slider and being able to do something super fast, that's what intrigues me. That's what really... And, you know, I, I, it trips my trigger, so to speak. So I'm going to, uh, and by the way, you could do batch processing, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I'm going to open up uh, a hummingbird here. Just want to show you that, you know, we have all the, the real basic tools. We have a tool menu here and we have a crop button. So I want to bring this guy in like so. Simple as that. Maybe bring down little bit from the top. Good. Click done. Now remember, I just want to get in and out of this thing. So I'm going to click my thing. Now that did some bad stuff to the background, so I would probably edit that. But I can fix a lot of it with that filter. So we're talking about two clicks. And now this picture compared to this. Look at that. Impressive. It would make you think I know something about post-processing. Well, you know what the beauty of, of your explanation with working with Luminar is? It, it can be simple. A lot of people do try to make things more complex. But I noticed just with even three sliders, your Accent AI, the Sky Filter, and a little bit of playing with the, the Detail Filter, I mean, it's really made it pop. And it doesn't have to be 25 layers with 45 filters. Uh, just some smart filters seem to really get the job done. Yeah, I don't get paid for any of that. <laughs> Here's the thing. I teach a lot. I, I, I go to a lot of the big conventions. I speak. And people want to tell me about their workflows. And they want to. They seem to think there's a badge of honor, Abba, because it was hard. 
but nobody cares. You don't get paid because it was hard. Nobody cares about your effort. They care about the result. In the photographic world, we get paid for the picture, not the process. This is something I've been teaching for decades. If you're living in a world of process, it probably means your pictures aren't that great. If you're worried, Rick, Rick Salmon, his dad, bless his heart, was not a photographer, but he had the best saying I've ever heard. Rick Sam would talk to about people about, well, they got too much noise in their picture. And his dad, who's an elderly gentleman, would pop up, well, if all you're talking about is the noise in the picture, it must not be a very good picture to begin with. Yeah. <laughs> I, always got a, I always got a real kick out of that. As far as I'm concerned, simple is better. It goes from my whole philosophy in photography. I have a simple, clear background here. I want a simple post-processing event. And then I want to be able to share it. We have the share button here. I can immediately send it to email, messages, smug mug, 500 pics. I can export it as a TIFF. I do want to make one other uh, important distinction here, Abba. When you, when you save one of our images from Luminar, you click the Save button. You know, you have the ability to save the history when you save it as a Luminar file. Now, let's talk about that. The history, if you want, if you want to look at the history of any image, um, there's our history. This shows you the presets I did, crops I did, etc. If we were in Photoshop when we we did this and we closed the image, what would have happened to our history, Abba? It would be history. <laughs> when you open the picture back up, you wouldn't be able to get to it. Mm -hmm. But we allow you to save that history in three years from now, you can go back and go right to that spot in the pictures edit process. I think that's amazing. And um, I, th I think that's one of the most powerful features we offer that people don't talk about. But I wanna close this, uh, this webinar down with some very simple thoughts. I've been doing this longer than most of the people listening to this show have been alive. And I've been getting paid for it for a long time and I've had some success. And I want to say that if this is good enough for me, it ought to be good enough for everybody, <laughs> because I don't think that there's a reason to make things hard uh, just because you want to make them hard. I think the opposite is true. You want to make things as easy as possible. If you are able to make things easy and share, then you, you, know, you can get out there and start licensing your images, start selling your prints, start getting gigs, start getting assignments. You know, you're not going to do any of that while you're in post. Now, if you're just doing this for fun and you like all that stuff, well, God bless you. None of what I said just applies to you. But for everybody else, I think it makes a big difference to make it simple. Our goal at Luminar and, and Skylum is simple. We want to take complex tasks and make them simple. So don't think that there isn't complex work here being done because there is. It's just that we've made it look easy. It's not any less complex than any other piece of post-processing software. It's just that we've made it look easy. So I'm not here to teach Luminar. There are two people on this uh, webinar who have done a lot of that, and you can find their efforts at Skylum.com. That's Ab and Lori. They've created a ton of teaching material. Um, I just wanted to show you how I use it. It's it's really simple. It's really fast. Of course, we have limited time, so we can't get into the whole nine yards, but uh, we're going to wrap up here. Abba, I need to know if there's anybody that might want to win a free copy of Luminar. I would say yes. Well, what I'd like for you to do is um, open up for the next 15 seconds. Everybody just type in, I want to win, and then you and or Lori pick somebody at random, um, get their contact information, send it to me, and I will have my assistant Jenny send them a license code for a fully operating version. And uh, I'm really grateful for everyone that took time out of their busy day to sit and listen to this. And I know some people are gonna watch the recorded version. Sorry, none of you guys can win Luminar. You have to be here live for that, but uh, you can hopefully learn something from what I did. Uh, feel free to follow me on Instagram at born.scott. For whatever reason, Scott Bourne was taken, but I'm also on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter at Scott Bourne. And of course you can go to scottbourne.com and you can reach me at scott at scott Skylum.com. If you think there's anything I can do to help you, I'm very interested in doing that. And also, Lauren Abbey, I believe I believe we have uh, the presentation is going to be available for people to download in the form of a PDF, and you will make them aware of that in the follow-up, right? Yes, yes, we will make the links, and it will be available within about the next 24 to 48 hours. Scott, I want to thank you from myself and everybody viewing. Not only have you given away an amazing number of secrets, and a lot of photographers don't like to share their secrets, uh, not just for birds, but 
this can all be translated to all different types of photography, just some of the techniques and thought that you put behind your images. So I, I want to send out a thank you to you from everybody listening and from myself and Lori for your presentation. Hey, it's my honor, my pleasure, and my privilege. I uh, hope everybody found it helpful. We'll see you next time.